So we know that the change in internal energy delta E is equal to Q, the heat transferred, plus W, the work done. And delta E is defined to be the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. So in the last lecture, we pointed out that in, in order to be consistent with the sign convention on delta E, we need to have that when heat flows from the surroundings to the system, that Q is greater than zero. And similarly, when the surroundings does work on the system, W is greater than zero. And again, these have to be so that when heat flows from the surroundings into the system, we have the delta E is also greater than zero. Q is greater than zero, so delta E is greater than zero. And that fits together with our sign convention that delta E is equal to E final minus E initial. So in this one, we're going to focus on heat, whereas in the last one we talked about work. Now, to talk about heat, we have to introduce a new concept. And that new concept is the molar heat capacity, excuse me, the heat capacity. What the heat capacity is, is how much energy you have to put in to raise the sample that you have by a certain temperature. For instance, one degree Celsius, a nice convenient number. So the heat capacity of an object is how much heat you have to um, put in, how much energy you have to add as heat in order to raise the temperature of that object by one degree Celsius. Now, the problem with the heat capacity in general is that it's an extensive property. That means it depends on how much stuff you have. And that makes perfect sense because, for instance, if you have a huge pot of water and you have a little saucepan of water and you, you put in some quantity of heat into the two, you expect that the saucepan is going to have its temperature changed by a lot, whereas the big pot of water is going to have its temperature changed only by a little bit. And so in order to have an intensive property, what we need to do is, is consider how much stuff we've got. So we're going to define two quantities. And the first quantity is the specific heat capacity. And the specific heat capacity is units of joules per gram degree Celsius. And what it represents is how much energy you have to put in in joules to heat one gram of a pure substance up by one degree Celsius. And you can see that there are some numbers here um, for aluminum, copper, ethanol, iron, and water. Now, we can also define another intensive property called the molar heat capacity. And the molar heat capacity is going to be the number of uh, joules of energy you have to put in to raise one mole of the compound by one degree Celsius. And you can see that we have values for, um, again, aluminum and copper and ethanol and iron and water. Now, how are these two related? These two are related by the molar mass, right? If you think about what the units are, if you multiply the quantity in this left-hand column by the molar mass of the substance, you're going to get the molar heat capacity. So, and that makes sense based on the units. Now, you'll notice that the specific heat capacity of water is unusually large. It's actually 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. It's over four times larger than aluminum. Now, what effect does this have? It turns out that people who live by a large body of water tend to see the temperature of their city fluctuate much less than people who live far away from a body of water. Why? The body of water acts like a buffer. It takes a lot of energy to heat the water up during the day. And then the water has a lot of energy, which it gives back during the night. And so it evens out some of the temperature swings that might actually otherwise occur. And in fact, if we didn't have any water on the planet at all, during the day, the side of the planet that was facing the sun would get really, really, really hot. And then at night, it would get really, really, really cold because things like aluminum and copper don't have the ability to store energy as heat that water does. So having the oceans is very important for climate regulation. 